Well, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And this is our first lecture for the year in our multimodality imaging conference. Um, I want to welcome all of you to the academic year. And usually in the academic year at the beginning, we start talking about various imaging technologies. We'll start with ultrasound, with echocardiography, and we'll address all the others. We'll address nuclear, CT, MRI, uh, from a technical point of view as to how do you acquire the image, what are some of the advantages, disadvantages for each one of the technologies. Then we address uh, disease states and how do you evaluate them with uh, the armamentarium that we have in various imaging modalities, be it ventricular function, systolic, diastolic, etc. So I think um, uh, to get us started, uh, this is what we will be talking about today, is to have a feel for echocardiography and Doppler. How are the images uh, acquired? What's the principle? What's behind the ultrasound machine and your interpretation uh, screen that you're looking at? Uh, and it is so important because the image is modulated depending on how you acquire the image. You can do some post-processing, but most of the important information is acquired at the forefront, and therefore knowing what settings you have this machine and how do you acquire them, how much depth, how much gain, uh, what does it mean, uh, what's the Doppler like, how is it acquired, is it pulse repetition, is this high PRF, is this continuous wave Doppler, how about 3D? Um, believe it or not, we could, we could take this uh, lecture for more than one hour. You could spend almost half a day talking about the intricacies of ultrasound. And uh, ultrasound has really evolved over the years, and this is your family of techniques that we use. And uh, it is really amazing if you've been in the field for some time to see how really it has progressed and yet the imaging principles are still the same. So here we have from M mode to 2D, 3D, some Doppler techniques, some contrast, etc. And, uh, and the imaging modalities are still uh, have the same basic. And the basic is that you take a piezoelectric crystal and piezoelectric meaning that it uh, can be excited either mechanically or electronically and it can vibrate to a point where you may not feel it vibrate but it can emit an ultrasound. An ultrasound obviously is just like the name states it. It's beyond your hearing, your audible frequency. Audible frequency is up maybe to if you have good ears, about maybe 20,000, 25,000. Uh, or you know, or 20 kilohertz or so and beyond that you're not going to hear this ultrasound and here we're talking about in the megahertz so in the millions of, of uh, uh, frequency and therefore the wavelength is very very tiny and uh, the principle is I send this burst of, of uh, wave that goes and try to hit a either more reflectant or less reflectant uh, you know, object or medium. And uh, in the past, you I know you don't hear about it, but it used to be called an A mode. So if my reflection from that from that object or from that myocardium is stronger than the other, it's more reflectant, and I can assign it an amplitude, and it will be an A mode or an amplitude mode. Now you could take this and turn it. 90 degree towards you. So therefore, you could change this amplitude to a brightness, and therefore, the more reflectant medium, be it calcium, etc., will be brighter than a less reflectant medium, which could be the myocardium. And therefore, you have a brightness mode. And believe it or not, 2D nowadays, the way you see it, is a manifestation of a B mode at different depth. And the way we know about depth is we know what the velocity of ultrasound is in the body and the biological medium, usually about 1,500 meters per second. 
And if I send a little burst of ultrasound and wait for it to get reflected back, and if I know how long it took, therefore I know the, the velocity and therefore I know how deep it is. Now this brightness mode can be taken to uh, put some motion with it and uh, this is where if you use an M mode, right, you have a dot but a dot over time, what's really happening let's say to, uh, you know, to the pericardium per se, the pericardium is not moving that much so if I have a dot there and I spread it over time, it's not moving, so it's a straight line, as opposed to a posterior, you know, uh, myocardium and the posterior wall. These dots are moving upward anteriorly towards the transducer over time and then it goes down and then you could see it going up and down. And this is your, basically, your M mode, a motion. It's not mitral valve, it's, it's a reflex motion. And these are some examples that are obviously classic. For most of you, this is uh, very well known. What happens to the aortic valve on top is the aortic valve is closed, then it opens in systole, and then you could see it almost like a box because in systole there is not much motion after it opens and it closes. So you see this box motion. You could see uh, at the ventricular level, uh, you could see what's happening to the uh, septum itself. It goes in systole towards the LV cavity, mitral valve, opens up a little bit, and then with an atrial kick, if you have sinus rhythm, you can see another uh, wave to the mitral valve, and the bottom there is, is basically your left ventricle. You could see thickening in systole, right? And some endocardial motion towards the center of the cavity, and that's all basically a B mode that is spent over time and you could change the sweep speed if you want more time resolution and this is your M mode from it. Okay? So if we take a look at this ultrasound picture on this echocardiogram from the parasternal long, you start thinking say, well how, how is this image obtained? Right? Uh, we have usually an ultrasound a sector as opposed to in vascular ultrasound or abdominal ultrasound where it's almost like a box. And the reason for it is we have to adapt and adopt a medium to go between the ribs. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have some shadowing because all the ribs will shadow quite a bit of the ultrasound. So therefore, that's why it is more of a sector emanating from a small point. And uh, the way this image is obtained is... Uh, goes back to the basics of ultrasound. And in the basics of ultrasound, and said, how do I... Uh, we talked a little bit about depth, hmm? that if I send a little burst, and believe it or not, these bursts are packets. These are small packets, and the packets could be maybe three wavelength in a row, four wavelength, or five wavelength. If you send continuously, like buzzing all the time, it will be very hard for you to know when, what is your sending and all the ways, the waves that are reflected back, so it just becomes very confusing. Uh, you could take, as an example, if you're in a valley and uh, you scream, have one scream, one pulse of ultrasound, you can hear it reflecting back, so I can tell actually how deep this valley is from you back, but if you keep screaming all the time, you're you're mixing your sound that is emanating from you with the reflected sound from the mountains, and you're not going to be able to tell the depth of these mountains. Okay? So that's the same principle here, is I will send a little packet, and where I'm going to send it? I'm going to send it along the line of, you know, a, a line of uh, where the ultrasound is going. Now, for me to be able to create a sector, I will send this and then move my, my uh, line of ultrasound to a next one, a next one, a next one, a next one to go throughout the sector. And some of these lines could be 150, 160 per scan. And uh, you don't see them because they're smoothed in a way. Uh, but you could tell also some of the issues is that this cone of ultrasound, and you can think of it as a cone of ultrasound along this line, will spread further and further and further out, you know, as you go in the medium. And at the same time, 
the spacing between those cones towards the end uh, of the image as opposed to the beginning of the image is much wider. And this is where some of the issues will come with resolutions down the line. So for me to create this image here, what I'm doing basically is I'm sending, I'm going to go back to the image, I'm sending this ultrasound beam in one direction. Now I could send it maybe two times or three times to make sure that my accuracy, and this is the line density it's called, my accuracy is correct. Then I move on to the second one, third, fourth, 150, and then sweep it again, sweep it again, sweep it again. You're not going to see it here, right? But part of this uh, sweeping is what's the frequency, right, of, of your image here is how many, how many frames per second are you going to be able to see, right? And uh, nowadays with parallel processing and so many other things that you could improve your, your you know, frame rate of what you're seeing to the 90s, even 100s, and even you know, 100s frames per second that you're updating it. So uh, image processing has really improved so much over time. So that's how a, a 2D image. So it's all, believe it or not, all brightness mode, right? Uh, that's why a calcium may look much more, uh, you know, reflectant than a myocardium. Um, also, you have to think also of the principles of ultrasound reflection versus uh, uh, being uh, the, the image being reflected from that ultrasound. M many most of it is actually refracted so if you take a if you take a light and it's the same principle and you shine it you shine it on let's say in a pool in a pool you just shine the light on the pool itself from the outside some of that light is reflected back on the surface of the pool water and most of it is refracted inside and it really depends on the medium of how much refraction there is, how much reflection there is. The same thing happens here. So uh, what you're depending on is what is reflected back to your ultrasound for you to be able to, to process it and go forward. Um, we have to think about image resolution because uh, you're sending wavelets. And, uh, and the way we think about it is most of the time in the axial and lateral resolution, but also you have to, now with 3D, you have to think about the other resolution in the azimuthal plane. So axial resolution is along the line of, of uh, basically these scan lines that you're sending. So if I'm going to, I'll try to use maybe a pointer here. And laser pointer. Let me try it. Is it working? Okay. So if I take a look at, at the, these packets of wavelets, right? And my question is, hmm, how do I know or can I resolve one dot right here and one dot right there close together? How can I, how can I make sure that these two dots are separate as opposed to showing as one dot? This is basically your spatial resolution. And intuitively, you would think that, hmm, if my wavelength is very tiny, I'm going to be able to resolve these two separately, as opposed to my wavelength is so big from here to here, then these two dots are going to basically look like one. So there are actually two factors, one of them that you think about and you can modify, which is the wavelength which is inversely related to the frequency. So my higher frequency, the smaller the wavelength. So if I use a 3 megahertz versus a 5 megahertz, the higher frequency has a smaller wavelength and therefore has much better resolution, right? So higher resolution with higher frequency transducers, lower resolutions with lower frequency transducers. The other one is the packet length that you're not going to change. That's already inherent there. So the packet length would be determinant, but from a practical point of view, axial resolution is predominantly dependent on the frequency. And that's why we ask you to use 
as much as possible high frequency transducers because your resolution is would be in the sub millimeter at three if you use a three megahertz the wavelength is 0.5 millimeters so you know that if you're in the five range or so your resolution is down to half a millimeter or so which will give you certainly a tremendous resolution going forward now this resolution is along the line of these scan lines here. So this is called the axial resolution, which is better than the resolution which is lateral, meaning differentiating a dot here and a dot there. And that's called lateral resolution. Lateral resolution in ultrasound is always worse than axial resolution. And part of it is because of what happens to these cones. You think about them as lines, but they're not lines. They're cones. I'm sending you here, it's almost like a cone. And what happens with distance, and there's going to be more dispersion of this cone. It's sound. It's ultrasound. And there are a few things that you could do, which is focusing. So you can focus it almost like a electromagnetic wave or even like light you can focusing with various length with various lenses or electronically you can focus it but irrespective this lateral resolution will depend on the width of each of these cones and the width of the cone will get worse and worse although you may adjust for it by focusing usually it will get worse as as when you start going further and further from your transducer here okay so this is your lateral resolution. Your other resolution is the axial resolution. But overall, in general, use the highest frequency that you can so that you can have the best resolution. Now, one caveat to that is the higher the frequency, the smaller these wavelets are, right? The smaller the wavelength, the less power you can have. So you have to play with penetration into the body versus resolution. So if I use a 7 megahertz, let's say, I may not be able to penetrate as well, so the image may not look as good, although I may have a higher resolution. And therefore, that's why you play this multi-frequency transducers to try to aim for decent penetration at the same time as a decent resolution. And you could see that interplay when you do transesophageals if you want. If you're if you're in the transgastric window and you're far from the heart, you may want to reduce, hmm? you reduce your frequency so that your penetration is better. As you go back up towards the aorta, you're very close to it. You may want to increase your frequency. That's what I usually do so that my resolution is much better in the aorta. So this is where you as an operator will come into play and, uh, and, and improve this penetration versus resolution. Uh, instrument controls are very important, obviously, and this is overall gain, time gain compensation, lateral gain compensation, reject compression, all these here are, believe it or not, post-processing. I Meaning, I have my transducer here. It has all these nice tiny crystals, uh, quite a few crystals. This is a science by itself, believe it or not. I send this ultrasound, these packets of ultrasound. I steer them if I need to steer them. Uh, the ultrasound is, is uh, gotten back to the transducer. It excites this transducer again, right? I can move this electronics back into imaging. That's how I resolve the image. But most of the things that I do gain, increase the gain of all the image. <clears throat> Time gain compensation, I can increase the gain at a certain depth. And it's called time gain compensation because, believe it or not, depth is time in a way in ultrasound, right? Reject or compress, depending of where do you want to you know, take this rejection, all these are post-processing, meaning I'm not changing the amount of energy I'm sending in. All what I'm changing is the display of the total gain, et cetera, et cetera, that's coming back. The only one that is actually an output power is what's called the mechanical index. And that in the past obviously is regulated based on safety, 
mostly, meaning that obviously you can have so much energy to destroy a, uh, an organ, and uh, you know that energy, for example, is used for lithotripsy. Uh, you, know, you can send so much energy that you could destroy. So for ultrasound imaging, the energy is kept low. The mechanical index usually is no lo no bigger than 1.4, 1.5, etc. But we've made much more aware of the mechanical index because of contrast, right? Contrast, using contrast, the higher mechanical in when you send more energy, you're going to destroy them much more, and therefore you're much more sensitive to it. So before contrast, it was kind of in the background, and now it's much more in the forefront because otherwise you're not going to be able to display good images. And what's this mechanical index? It's peak negative pressure divided by the frequency. So if you take a look at just one wavelength there, uh, the peak negative pressure is, is basically how much negative pressure in that descent portion of the wavelength is. So you know in contrast uh, you can compress the little tiny bubble if you want to. You're not going to destroy it if you compress it. But on the negative portion this is where you can expand it so much that basically it will destroy. A uh, few other things in ultrasound that you have to kind of keep in mind and these are some of the artifacts that you see. Uh, some of the reverberations, there is attenuation. Attenuation is very important. And take an example, uh, prosthetic valve, big calcification of the annulus, let's say. What's going to happen is I send my ultrasound, and most of it is reflected back because this density of the material is so high. I'm not going to have, most of it is reflected back. So it will look very bright, but what's happening behind it is since I'm reflecting most of this ultrasound, very little is going through it. So there will be a big shadow behind it, a big blackness. And that blackness will prevent you from seeing things behind it. So behind calcified valves, behind big calcifications, behind whatever it is reflectant, you're not going to see as much. And once we get to the Doppler portion, you're not going to be able to, to interrogate with Doppler because penetration of ultrasound is part of Doppler equation. If I don't get any ultrasound going further and further, I'm not going to be able to ask the question is how much frequency was changed. Uh, you're going to have also some reverberations. Some, uh, here you go, you have, you have some right here in a prosthetic valve in the, and with a, with a thrombus in the, in the atrium. Uh, you see this reverberations and shadowing and uh, just bad artifacts and some of that is some of these reverberations will be reflected back back and forth back and forth between the medium of of the ultrasound transducer itself as well as you know the the more reflectant one and at times also if it is if things are close to you and reflectant uh, take a look at this you know, apex, uh, well, is, there, is there a thrombus in this area? Yes or no? Is this an artifact? You can't tell at times. And, and why, why do you have this abnormality here, or what looks like an abnormality? Believe it or not, this highly reflectant area that you see, which is your first phase of the pericardium or epicardium, is reflectant enough that the ultrasound waves are reflected back to the casing of the ultrasound and it gets reflected back here, back and forth, back and forth, so you have some reverberations and uh, you know more, believe it or not, even more harmonic uh, that is uh, produced and therefore you don't see it as, as really as nice as you'd like. And nowadays you could use harmonic, it decreases some of that clutter that you see in the apex but you can also use contrast that will define it and see whether indeed there is a thrombus, yes or no. So this is a historical slide because really the technology has evolved so much over time. We have fully digital systems nowadays. We grew up in the days of video, not digital. High frame rates nowadays is, is part of routine. Uh, image quality is certainly better. In the old days, multi-frequency transducers were not there. They were not broadband. So a transducer, you would, you would have a series of transducers on the machines. 
One of them was a 2.5 fundamental, the other one was 3, the other one is 3.5, the other one is 5, the other one is 7. And then if you wanted to change from one, trans one frequency to another to improve resolution, you had to change the whole thing. Nowadays you have broadband, so it's much more, and then you could decide electronically which frequencies I want to emphasize. You'd like to emphasize most of the time the higher frequency, and if you can't, you just change it, decrease it, have more penetration, etc., etc. Harmonic imaging, very important. We'll talk about it. Tissue Doppler, digital image, 3D. This is all what we're going to talk about today. Harmonic. What's harmonic? Well, harmonic is when, when I send a certain frequency, and none of the frequencies are really pure. You, you have a major, let's say most of the frequencies are, let's say, at 3 megahertz or something that you're sending. Uh, you'll have some a little less, some a little more, but the vast majority is around this what's called fundamental frequency. This is the frequency that you're sending at with this. Okay? Now, uh, interesting enough, depends on how the tissue responds to this frequency. We thought initially that myocardium will respond just the same, meaning if I send a 3 megahertz uh, frequency, I'm going to reflect back 3 megahertz frequency, and that doesn't change. Uh, I'll give you an example where if you play an instrument, if you play a piano or a guitar or a string instrument, right, if you hit it gently, it will emit at that fundamental frequency, whatever that frequency is. If you hit it harder, it will emit the fundamental frequency and multiples of it, right? So if you want to imitate the sound, if I hit a, let's say, a C note, bam, okay? That's my C note. That's my frequency. If I hit it harder, right? So I hear, I hear the fundamental, and I hear multiples of it. And they could be in the first harmonic. So this is fundamental. This is first harmonic. So these are multiple of this frequency higher. And there is subharmonic, believe it or not, even lower frequency than the initial resonant frequency, the initial fundamental frequency. Now, why do we bring this about? We bring this about because while people were studying what happens to harmonic imaging, and what I mean by harmonic imaging, if this is my fundamental frequency, let's say 3.5, or let's say 3 megahertz transducer, right? Uh, and I want to listen to the, free, the, to the multiple of that frequency. I want to listen maybe at 6 or something like this. Uh, what kind of sound would I listen to or what kind of image do I render? People started uh, doing this mostly for contrast because in the evaluation of contrast, people have noticed that these tiny little tiny micro bubbles are very sensitive. Obviously, you excite them with, with ultrasound. But when you send a certain fundamental frequency, they vibrate, just like I told you, just like a, you know, in a, a string instrument. They'll vibrate and they'll send fundamental frequency and they send harmonics. I said, hmm, if I, if I image on the harmonic portion, right, I take away the noise, I emphasize the thing coming from the contrast, and therefore I have a brighter image with contrast compared to the myocardium or compared to any other structure. Now, the interesting thing is, during this investigation of contrast, right, image instruments came, and also, so now we have transducers can image at harmonic as opposed to just fundamental, found out that actually even the native tissue even the native tissue, the myocardium, emits harmonics. So therefore, conceivably, that you could take some of the clutter that you saw if you image with harmonic imaging. And this is what you see. This is an example right here of fundamental imaging on the left. And that's what you use nowadays in the vast majority of the cases. You're using harmonic imaging. And this is the same case. Notice a bit of a difference. It's a, what looks like a sharper image, but here much more clutter, particularly closer to the apex. So therefore, you're cleaning. And the ad adoption of this concept was pretty much within a year or two. People, I mean, th this is very easy to adopt. 
Now, remember one thing though, that if I'm if I am imaging at harmonic, meaning if I'm imaging at this frequency here, my fundamental frequency hmm, is half of it. So if I if I look on the machine and say 3.5 megahertz harmonic with an H or whatever the whatever this machine tells you, it means that it means, <laughs> please stop, <laughs> it, it means that uh, I'm sending half of that frequency, right? So if I'm at 3, I'm sending at 1.5, which has a bit of a downside to it. Remember what we talked about frequency and resolution. So therefore, I'm, I'm sending it at a lower frequency, and therefore, my resolution is less. And that's why valves may look thicker, because the resolution is not as sharp, okay? So I'm, I'm trading. I'm trading a cleaner image with a less resolution image. So you have to kind of keep thinking around. That's why I tell the fellows, don't, don't call it thickening of every every valve because they may not necessarily be thick they may look thicker and people have studied that and actually it's a little thicker than if you use fundamental imaging at a higher frequency right so there's this little trade-off of a cleaner image with less clutter compared to mm, a little bit of lesser resolution now uh, you're not novice uh, this is contrast imaging and with contrast, I think it's, it's obviously very powerful that if I don't see, and this is the current clinical indication, if I don't see two segments or more of the, of the heart, it's clinically indicated to use contrast. But I think it's important to talk about contrast since we already talked about mechanical index, etc. So take a look at this. Hmm? This is a, uh, an image here. And this is, this is contrast being injected, so the contrast is already there. And it uh, doesn't look too pleasing, does it? You know, it, uh, it almost has the same intensity as the myocardium. I'm not sure it really helped me tremendously. Uh, yet, if I uh, change one little thing in it, the image is much more appealing. What do you think I've changed? Harmonic imaging, right? So this was fundamental imaging, and this is harmonic. Just flip of a switch, right? Flip of a switch. So I'm emphasizing much more the harmonic, you know, reflections of this ultrasound, right? So I sent a certain fundamental frequency and the harmonic, uh, I can't even see it here, if it is. Yes, here it is. 3.5 megahertz harmonic, right? So what I sent was not 3.5, was one, uh, whatever it is, half of 3.5, right? But at the same time, I've emphasized much more the harmonic images. And in this heart, contrast will have much more signal from harmonic than myocardium, and that's why you can differentiate it much better. So this is, this is really number one for you to keep in mind regarding harmonic, etc. Uh, how about Doppler? Okay, so we talked about MO2D. We talked about brightness. We talked about resolution, axial and lateral resolution. Uh, we talked about fundamental and harmonic. That harmonic is, is important both in regular imaging with a little downside. So if things may look too thick, just go back to fundamental and higher frequency. And we talked about that when you use contrast, and I know we'll have a full talk on contrast itself, make sure that you're using harmonic in most of these images, and the reason for it is the signal from it is, is much stronger. Since we're talking about it, but very important, I know we have new sonographers, is that make sure that your mechanical index is not too high, otherwise you're gonna destroy too much. The image not gonna be as contrasty, you're gonna see like black and white, almost hurricane, so usually for you to see well contrast, your mechanical index has to be low, and low is about 0 0.3, 0 0.2, no more than usually 0 0.4. So it's got to be low, otherwise you're going to destroy them. 
so let's switch gear and talk about Doppler. You know, Doppler is, is certainly very important, but it's the amazing thing to me is that here you go, you have a transducer, I have the same principle, I sent a little packet of ultrasound, goes down, reflects, come back, I analyze it for brightness, etc. But Doppler is using the same instrument. You haven't done anything different. The only thing you've done is ask a different question. I'm asking the question, not the question of how much of this ultrasound I got back, because the more, you know, the brighter, right? Uh, more intense. I'm asking, said, hmm, I sent a certain frequency and this thing is moving. And there is this Doppler principle that said, well, if this thing is moving, it's changing the frequency of what I sent. So it's the same instrument, but asking a different question and solving that question. So let's talk about it a bit, okay? Um, Doppler, uh, the, the reason why Doppler is still capital, I don't know if it's going to be not capital, it is the name of Christian Doppler, right? He's a physicist in Salzburg, Austria. I should, actually, I went to where his, uh, his you know, site was. It's, it's no longer that site. Actually, it's pretty close to a Mozart site where Mozart was. was uh, just imagine, I mean, the, these giants, one in physics and one in, one in music. And uh, so, believe it or not, in the 1800s, you know, this individual recognized that because the stars were moving in different parts, they, they have a, a shift in color. And from that developed this wonderful Doppler equation that is, looks quite complex still. But just imagine in the 1800s, you didn't have all these sophistication, but people were, were smart enough to be able to solve things. So that's the Doppler equation. And the Doppler equation states simply that if there is a certain frequency and there is a, either you emitting the frequency or you hit an object that is moving, you'll shift that frequency a bit. You'll shift it. It won't be exactly the same. It may be a little more or maybe a little less. And the interesting thing is also dependent on how fast this object is and how are you interrogating it? Are you right head on or are you, you know, on the side? So that's simplistically, that's what it is. So you want a life example, you just go out on the street here and you have plenty of life examples. Is um, the train is coming, right? You can close your eyes and you can tell where the train is. Is it on the right or on the left? But most importantly, if the train is coming this way, I can tell if it is coming towards me or going away from me. Because if it's coming towards me, frequency increases and then it starts decreasing when it's going away from me. So it goes, I know if it is going up, it's coming towards me, going away, right? And interestingly enough, if you are perpendicular to the motion, perpendicular, so if I'm sitting here, Main Street is down there, and it's further away from me perpendicular, I'm not going to hear a difference. The best difference I will hear if I'm in line, if I'm, you know, uh, almost suicidal, standing, right, and, and waiting for the train to just come through me and then go out, right? Hopefully it's not happening today. Uh, but, but this is your life example, same thing in, in many things. So you can tell, also you can tell, not only the direction, I can tell how fast this train is coming towards me, right? If it shifts much quicker, much higher, I know it's faster coming towards me. So this is application of ultrasound. So you can imagine if I send a three megahertz, right? That's what I'm imaging and I turn on Doppler. My question then is, hmm, I sent three megahertz. Something is moving, either the muscle or the blood and I reflect it back, the question to me is, is it 3 megahertz plus 100 kilohertz? And the shifts are very small, and that's why it's in the audible range, right? Ultrasound is not in the audible range. Uh, or is it, uh, is it positive or negative, right? And how much is it? This is, this is really the basics of ultrasound. If you understand this, 
of, of, uh, of Doppler. If you understand this, you understood pretty much everything here. So this is just to show that obviously if this is my transducer and you know blood is going away from me or coming away from me, if it's coming towards me, I'm going to have compression. I'm going to have much higher frequency. And, uh, and it will be, you know, otherwise, you know, if it's going away from me, it's going to be much wider, right? And the shift is, is negative. Uh, Mike Quinones is here. I have left his rendering. These are actually, we'll, we'll go in the Museum of Hand Drawing. <laughs> All right. And uh, th this is his, actually, I have quite a few of them. I, I enjoy them because, interestingly enough, obviously, you could, uh, some examples of that. Take the arch. Right? This is the same blood coming up the arch, up the ascending aorta, and then going down. I can take my pulse sample volume, put it in the ascending aorta, it's coming towards me, just like you see up here, and then go down to the descending aorta, it's going down away from me. Right? And you could listen to it and hear the differences. In the past, the Leon nowadays where we don't we don't put audio, but in the past, that's how we trained. We trained, I mean, the, the whole the whole room was, was uh, uh, like a washing machine uh, uh, all day, right? But this is the equation, amazing equation that Dr. Doppler uh, came up with. Uh, I'm going to go down, go to the velocity, uh, or, or we could start with the frequency shift. This is since we talked about the frequency shift is related to the velocity, just like we talked about. The emitting frequency, whatever that initial frequency, and also related to cosine of the angulation, right? Cosine of the angle. If, the, if co cosine zero is one, so you don't have to worry, or, you know, 180 is also minus one. But if you're at 90 degree, cosine zero is zero, and therefore, yeah, cosine 90 is zero, and therefore you don't have a frequency shift, right? So... I want you to take it down to the equation below because that's what you see nowadays. When we trained, the y-axis was not velocity, was frequency shift. You see what I mean? So here, nowadays, all the instruments are displaying velocity. And you see one meter per second, two meters, three meters, etc. right? But it's already accounting for the frequency shift, obviously, it solved the equation. The emitting frequency, it's assuming that cosine theta is 1, meaning there's no angulation, and, you know, the velocity of sound in, in, you know, in the body. So it's solving the equation for you, and therefore it's important for you to know whether you're angulated, yes or no, because this is your major issue of whether you're really hitting the frequency, uh, you know, uh, parallel to it or, uh, or not. And uh, this is one of the uh, other drawings here telling you, basically, that if we have an angle of usually 20 or above, okay, and then you start significantly underestimating what the frequency shift is and therefore what the velocity is of blood. So that's, that's the importance of it. So that's the, that's the general principle. Now let's go through pulse and CW because they are important. The beauty of pulse Doppler is that I know the site of where this velocity shift is at, okay? And the way it happens is I send this burst of ultrasound that you see here on the left side. So I send this burst, okay? The packet of three, whatever it is. I don't do anything. I'm exaggerating here. I don't do anything. I don't listen to it. I know where my area of interest is here, right? So this is my area of interest. I know where the velocity is here, right, of, in, the, in the body, I know how long it would take for this burst to go down, being reflected by this blood, and go back up, okay? So I know how long it would take me. So I send this burst, I don't listen to it, till I know it went down and up, and then I listen. And I ask the question, I sent 3 megahertz, what's the frequency shift, right? And I sent it through a fast Fourier transform analysis, basically to uh, analyze this complexity of, of ultrasound. And I come up with what this frequency shift is like. Let's analyze it here. So I am at this depth. 
I sent this packet of ultrasound, it came back and I asked the question and I solved it. This is my velocity here, this is my time, right? These are, you know, reflectant from whatever medium and these are the red cells in the, in the blood. Most of them are going at this velocity, then there is a spectral dispersion, meaning some of them are going a little lower than others, etc., right? And then they decelerate. That's how you get it. And the beauty of pulse Doppler is I can range gate it. I, I know where the range is and where to put the pulse sample volume, so I know most likely it's coming from that side. Obviously, the applications are a lot. I can then interrogate different areas, different annuli. I can put it with cross-sectional area, I come up with flow, uh, look at mitral inflow, diastolic function, you name it. I mean, all these properties of velocities from that particular site, okay? There's this concept of aliasing. Remember, I'm sending this, I'm coming back, I have to wait a little bit, but my goodness, I mean, if the sample volume is, or the area of interest is way down there, right? very far, I have to wait too long, and if the velocity is much faster, I'm not going to be able to tell what it is. There's the concept of aliasing that this pulse repetition frequency of how often I have to send it, listen, send, listen, send, listen, has to be fast enough in relation to the velocity, right? Almost two times what this frequency would be for the Doppler shift or more, right? And that's why I can resolve let's say what the usual velocity is about one meter per second or so. If my velocity of the regurgitant jet is three meters, four meters, I don't have enough pulse repetition to be able to solve it. And therefore I have aliasing. And what does aliasing look like? Well, it, uh, it looks like, you know, things are on top of each other. And basically this is mitral regurgitation by pulse Doppler. I can't resolve it. I cannot tell which direction. I can't tell the velocity, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we can change the baseline up and down a little bit to gain a little more of this, uh, you know, uh, aliasing or issue, but you know where the problem is. If it goes beyond that, yeah, you're not going to be able to solve it, okay? So, how about color? What's color? Well, color has, has pretty much the same principle, believe it or not. These are small, tiny... Believe it or not, sample volumes, tiny, they are throughout. So instead of just one, there are multiple. And along the scan line. So we're not talking about just one scan line. You're talking about multiple. It tells you where the complexity is. With current, with current uh, computers, I can't resolve with the highest degree of accuracy of what these frequency shift is. I can't really put fast Fourier transform analysis to do it made down the line, but now all what I have is, is a methodology called autocorrelation, or at least gives me a, an average of what the velocity is, and assign it a color. And the color is either coming towards me or going away. And uh, the other thing is, you know, how bright is it? Is it, uh, you know, in the red or yellow zone? And aliasing will come, you know, the same phenomena is going to happen. Is aliasing, I'll have a mosaic of these colors and it will look mosaic and therefore I know that it's aliasing as opposed to uh, just changing direction. So uh, it is a multi-gate and uh, this is an example of your mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation, I have here I have colors that I can resolve and here I have aliasing with this mosaic color because it has exceeded this Nyquist limit. And for color Doppler, the Nyquist limit is on the lower side, usually about you know, 7 ECMs per second, depending on the depth, etc. But remember also that I'm adding a complexity to pulse Doppler besides the frequency and the pulse repetition frequency that I'm, I'm sending at. I'm, ending, I'm adding complexity along the line, the depth, and the width of my sector of interest right? The deeper it is, the wider it is, right? It's going to take me much more time to be able to process it. And therefore, what happens? My frame rate goes down. It becomes very stroboscopic, right? And therefore, it may not give me this, you know, in-time, real-time motion of, of blood, of, of flow. And therefore, 
you have to optimize the image for color predominantly, right? I wouldn't bring shrink the whole image for color. You could do it for color and, and depend on where the area is. I think uh, that's very important from a, uh, ideally, you'd like to have a frame rate above 15, closer to 20 and above, I think would be great. So to have, you know, like what looks like real time. One thing about color that also, if, I mean, it's, it's an interest, I, I don't think it's a, really a puzzle, is that the difference between aliasing, and you look at aliasing when you look at PISA, for example, right? When you look at proximal isovelocity surface area coming in, you're looking for this shift from one direction to another so I know what the velocity is. Here, the difference between changing in direction versus aliasing, if I change in direction, I go through a black period. Right? So this is coming towards me. It's more on the yellow-reddish hue. This is going away from me, more bluish. And then when it comes perpendicular to it, I'm going to have zero frequency shift, and therefore it will be black as opposed to just aliasing, changing from one color to another without a black zone in between. Okay? So factors that influence color, obviously gain. Unfortunately, is not gain independent. It's very gain dependent. Color map, frame rate, Nyquist limit. We talked about all that. And this is, you know, a MS AI. If I overall, I get a much higher gain, the AI will look much worse than what it is. And, uh, you know, what's our usual? Our usual is you increase your gain enough so that you have a little clutter in the background. You come back a little bit. So at least crude, sorry, it is crude way to optimize gain. But this is the convention to optimize gain on a, on a particular individual. The other thing is Nyquist limit. Very important. This is the same jet, okay? Same jet. Right and left. Okay? Much thinner on the right side with an appropriate Nyquist limit. If I use a Nyquist limit that is small, right? Look what happens to the jet. It looks... Why? Because you're emphasizing the low velocity. You're emphasizing every little motion that occurs in the atrium and the ventricle, and therefore... Your eye is fooled by how big the jet is. Notice that. Keep that in mind, right? This is 21, low, appropriate at 57. So most of the appropriate Nyquist limits for you to evaluate jets should be between 50 and 70, somewhere there. At times, you may bring it down, bring down the Nyquist limit to emphasize, for whatever reason, low flow. But this is rare. And you want to make sure that you bring it back up to your overall evaluation because at times you may be called to the OR because of severe MR. I said, no, the patient had no severe MR. And it has happened. It has happened. Right? So keep that in mind because this is very important. Frame rate, we talked about it. I think this is very important to, to optimize frame rate for uh, patients with regurgitation. And I know we will have sessions for optimization and evaluation of regurgitant lesions and mitral regurgitation. I want to spend just a little time on pulse repetition frequency. You can fool the system, what's called high PRF. At times you've seen it. Basically, instead of just looking at one area here, how I'm going to fool the system to give me a much higher pulse repetition frequency, and therefore I can, I can resolve higher frequency. Uh, actually, I can put a sample volume right here, believe it or not, and say that this is my area of interest. So I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between this area of interest. But believe it or not, when you listen the second, the third, the fourth time, the fifth time, what are you listening for? You're listening this area, a multiple of it, this and this and this and this and this. So that if I have somebody with aortic stenosis right here, right, and I'm using a high pulse repetition frequency, I can resolve three meters per second or so, I can actually detect and record the aortic stenosis, which is way down. We had to use this in the early days before optimization of CW, et cetera, et cetera. But now you have continuous wave Doppler, and, and you don't have this, uh, this issue as much. And what's continuous wave Doppler? Well, I have two crystals here, or at least two transducers within one. I'm sending continuously, right? And I'm listening continuously. So what do I lose? I lose the range gating. 
I, I lose where exactly along this line these velocities are happening. So it's a conglomerate of everything that's going on. What's the gain? The gain is I'm not limited by aliasing anymore. So I can resolve very high velocities, right? So that's the pro and a con. It's along the same line, along whatever cone of ultrasound, and this is how I can resolve basically the high velocities. Tissue Doppler. Interesting enough, when you use color Doppler for flow, you don't look at tissue because of inherent, uh, they're, they're very different. Tissue Doppler, much stronger signal because it's coming from muscle, much lower velocity. Blood, lower signal, higher velocity. Very easy to put a filter and say, forget about muscle, give me blood, or forget about blood, give me muscle, right? And we've ignored this for, you know, almost 20 years or whatever it is, and then people have started to look at it, and all the beauties of what comes with tissue Doppler, myocardial properties, diastolic properties, you name it. Speckle tracking, 15 or so, almost 15. I was at the first presentation, it blew my mind of how can you really track, because your eye is trained gradually to try to track where the individual pixels are going. But speckle tracking is, is really amazing to be able to track things. So therefore, you could solve torsion, you could solve you know, uh, strain, and uh, strain basically is deformation. So if I start with a certain length of 10 centimeter and I compressed it, I have a strain of minus 20% because it's negative. And um, if I lengthen it, well, it's a positive strain, right? And we know in the myocardium there are all these changes. And if there's no change at all, there's, you know, no strain. And uh, the classic one is look at thickening of the posterior wall and the septum in an M mode because you could measure the astole and systole and see how much thickening there is. But the beauty of it is taking it to other views from the apical view where, you know, Speckle tracking is angle independent as opposed to Doppler. And then you could use strain rate, the rate at which these changes in deformation is occurring. So this is a slow strain rate as opposed to a much faster strain rate. A bit noisy of a signal, so we don't use it as much. But to tell you the truth, this is probably among the stronger ones to tell us about myocardial properties of things is, is, is the rate of change right, of these various areas. And you think of uh, different strain. Most of the time, what's in the, in the literature nowadays, say, uh, well, or oh, GLS, or global longitudinal strain, strain, which is from the apical window. Uh, great to follow people with, uh, you know, uh, cardio oncological issues, et cetera. Very sensitive marker, but but I would caution you because it is uh, when you look at deformation and strain, it's not only in this plane. The heart is, is, is being deformed, so if it is deformed in the longitudinal plane, something is happening in the radial and the circumferential area. I'll, I'll give you an example. Hypertension. When people have hypertensive heart disease, GLS, global longitudinal strain, is reduced, yet circumferential hmm, and radial strain increases. That's why ejection fraction stays the same or may be increased. So there are changes, adaptation to the heart in various diseases that can occur. So yes, it is a sensitive marker for GLS, but you have to think about the whole myocardium and what's being affected. GLS is much more you know, affected by endocardial fibers as opposed to the more mid or epicardial fibers, and it has its own things. And nowadays it can be nicely performed uh, with, uh, you know, automation. This is a normal heart, and this is a really very bad heart. Uh, you don't need strain to tell you, but I'm pretty sure it, it really looks bad, you know, going there. And, you know, it has a lot, I mean, throughout the year we will, we will be talking about it. Digital image is, is beautiful nowadays. It's taken for granted. I think it's been going on now for 15 plus years at least. The beauty of digital image to me, as opposed to the older days, is that you're able to take a look at multiple views of this heart, particularly that with ultrasound, you don't have a truly systematic way of acquiring the images. Yes, we have a protocol, but it's not serial. 
And for you to quantitate, you really need to take a look at this and avoid foreshortening. I know we'll be talking about that. 3D came on board, and I think 3D is important, particularly for volumetric measurements and spatial allocating spatial things in, in, uh, in the myocardium, be it structural or at times even functional. And I think the images have evolved in a way to uh, capture in a single beat that you could capture the myocardium. Uh, but if you want a little higher frequency, higher resolution, more volume, you may take, you know, two sequential beats, even three sequential or four sequential beats, depending on what you really want and take this whole information and then uh, basically cut it in different ways uh, for you to be able to take a look at heart and you know move these planes. Uh, volume rate has significantly improved nowadays, so you can start thinking about volumes per second, and that could be hopefully above 20. You can have 30 at times, even 40 volumes per second. And the strain that we talked about in a 2D arena can be done in 3D nowadays. And uh, you can get just beautiful images there, particularly from transesophageal. Transthoracic has been still problematic a bit for valvular heart disease, but I think for ventricular function, we really can improve on that and, uh, and try to improve it. Regurgitation is still an issue with 3D, uh, mostly because of temporal resolution and how much can, can you really get. So over time, things have improved so much. Still the same principle back in the 1950s. I haven't changed it. You have a piezoelectric crystal. You send the ultrasound, get it back, solve it for brightness, solve it for intensity. But the other thing is solve it for frequency shift. And this is where Doppler is. You could miniaturize it nowadays with handheld. And uh, just want to give you a little back reflection of how the old days were. This is in the early days, 1960. Dr. Edler himself doing the study, and you could see him coming on board with his nurse. Look at the outfit, it was a little different. I think this is how our sonographers should be dressed nowadays. No, just kidding. <laughs> and uh, this is Dr. Edler himself. And I just want to show you what ultrasound looked. Um, what, 56 years ago. Here you go. What is that mode? A mode, indeed. And we've evolved over time. And uh, uh, it really is amazing what you could do nowadays. So uh, keep those principles in mind because they are important as you navigate, optimize images, interpret images, uh, be it from the physics point of view, the artifacts that you can get, the optimization of Doppler, etc. Uh, and I think that will help you in the long run. So thank you very much for your attention.